All right, everybody, welcome back to the Move Podcast. Uh, brought to you each and every time by Aura Ring. We're talking about the 2021 Tour of Flanders. And I am actually super excited to talk about this one because this was exciting. A uh, little bit about Aura right quick. And I think the way to boil this down, I've talked about it every week uh, in terms of studying and really understanding your sleep data, not just your sleep data, your recovery data, your heart rate variability, your respiratory rate, your core temp. But let's just boil it down this way. Do you want better mental clarity? It starts with sleep. Do you want better and improved immunity? It starts with sleep. You want to be more efficient at work? It starts with sleep. Increase productivity? Guess what? It starts with sleep. You want better sleep? It starts with Aura. Head on over to Aura Ring, O-U-R-A Ring, dot com or ring.com get better at all those things um boys that was uh uh well i guess first we should because this is sort of an, a a very international uh flair uh, of of the move uh, this week not only are we covering a race all the way uh in belgium uh, i am sitting here uh in the bahamas spring break got the whole family down here i'm on our good friend mark holowesco's Beautiful little island in the Bahamas in the Exumas. I'm on Highborn Key. Uh, Johan over there in Madrid. JB, gosh, looks like he's in Austin, Texas. The big question is, where in the hell is is Hincapi with with the new poster behind him that says Casa del Jefe? For those that don't speak Spanish, that means House of the Boss. So where are you, and what is, are you trying to send us a message? This is actually not a poster. It's actually a painting, but. Um... I appreciate you uh, calling it out. I'm at, I'm at my good buddy and neighbor's house, Jeff Tabers, down in uh, Las Catalinas, Costa Rica. Amazing place with amazing mountain bike trails around it. So I'm going to get a bunch of riding in and some beach time. And we're also on spring break as well. We should all drop to our knees and pray that in our next life, we come back as George and Cappy. He is truly America's house guest. This is it's it's every week. It's somewhere new. Where next week you're going to be in Bali, Bali. Well, I don't get any invites from the boss anymore. So, you know, I got to find my way. I mean, you know, I never saw that Bahamas invite. Uh, family only family. Of course, of course, the one and only Chad Mountain is here. So I guess he's sort of worked his way into our family. Um, uh, before we jump into the action, today's show also brought to you by Roca. We talk about these guys and gals a lot. This uh, I, I love this brand. I think that's the best eyewear brand out there. Uh, we saw it a ton uh, in, in the Tour of Flanders today. Uh, based out of Austin, Texas, just a bunch of badass athletes. Uh, my readers, you know, guys, this is somebody tried on my readers the other day and they were like, whoa, dude, it's gotten bad. Um, but but not just the readers, but the, the glasses that I ride in golf and do everything in. Uh, they're the best. So head on over to Roka, R-O-K-A dot com. Uh, enter the discount slash buy code the move for 20 percent off your first purchase. Roca.com. Today's show also brought to you by Athletic Brewing. Talk about another cool group of founders, uh, Bill and John. Of you know, they they were big beer drinkers, uh, but they didn't always want to have alcoholic beer. And they looked around, and all these these you know these uh, you know non-alcoholic beers were were crap. And so they said, why can't we make a craft beer that tastes like other craft beers. And so for folks that are just a little sober curious, by the way, this is, I am starting my program after spring break. I, I, I talk about it all the time, but I haven't been doing it. Uh, I'm back now. Okay. And i once I get home, I'm doubling down and uh, I'm sober curious again and uh, only 50 to 70 calories per can. So keeps you lean and mean. Uh, they also uh, don't think that brewing uh, non-alcoholic craft beer is enough so they give back. So they, they're part of the two for the trails program. They donate 2% of all their sales to maintaining trails and parks that are often underserved. Head on over to athleticbrewing.com. The bike code there is the move 25 for 25% off your first time order. Translation. Athletic. Now that you mentioned that we're going to get cranky Lance again for the next, how long you going to go sober <laughs> for? I'm going to get yelled, random yelled at text messages. I, don't know. I can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> guys, that, this is this is what I've been talking about every week. You guys have been giving me grief. Now, now we're now we're talking about the bike race. This tour Flanders, we want. I want hard bike. We saw a hard bike race today. I mean, you had these three 
obviously the three strongest guys in the race with a, a fabulously surprising ending. Uh, that's the way bike racing should be. The three best duking it out at the front. I held for a second. We had a three man time trial after the last time over the Cuerma. I mean, that is what I'm talking about. Okay. Can we agree? A hundred percent agree. I was, I was restless in my bed last night. Although my aura ring does not say that I got a pretty decent sleep score. This is the hardest race in professional cycling. No doubt. No doubt. The guys that are doing this race are sleeping the night before trying not to think too much about the race because there's so much danger. There's so much risk involved. If you get past the danger, you get past the, the crashes, then you have to worry about how hard this race is. There's nobody at the end of this race that's feeling fresh. You saw one of the best riders in the world. His legs just gave out with a hundred meters to go. I mean, these guys that make it through all of the, the danger and the risk of this race at the end of the race, they have to get over this amazingly hard climbs. And it's just, it's a race where you don't, you finish with absolutely zero energy in the tank. It's the hardest race bar none in the, on the calendar. Johan, did you watch the whole race? No, no, I lost okay. the last 100 kilometers. Okay. Cause it came on TV here at like four in the morning. So I missed the start, but this race <laughs> was, wasn't without any controversy. We had two guys ejected right away for, for, uh, some sort of a fight, by the way, if you've ever seen two cyclists fight, uh, it's not good. It's not a good look. It's not uh, just go on YouTube and, and type in Leonardo Sierra bike fight. Uh, and you, you may never watch a bike race ever again, but apparently there was a fight that I missed. And these guys were ejected from the race. What, but what I'm still trying to understand what happened. Yeah, it was, it was something, you know, it's, it's something that happens a lot. You know, one guy was trying to go away. The other was it actually a teammate of uh, uh, Matthew Van Der Poel who was chasing an Astana guy. The Astana guy was not happy, braked a little bit. And then the, the Alpacin guy kind of gave him, gave him the elbow. And they were both both kicked out of the race. I think you know. With, with, uh, I think more than more than that, uh, those kind of things are understandable. I think because not only did they put themselves in danger, but the rest of the peloton because it was at the front of the peloton. But these new UCI rules about supposedly the safety of the riders, which includes not throwing bottles anymore away, um, and we saw uh, Michi Cher, teammate of Greg Van Avermaet, great classics rider. Um, Came back from a mechanical, and he had, he was he was on a spare bike. I think he threw a bottle away um, in a corner where there was spectators. So basically, that's these kind of habits are instilled in the reflexes of the cyclists, right? So whatever they want to throw something away, they look where there's people and they throw it away, and they make a kid happy, probably, right? Right. Uh, of course. And um, and the guy was kicked out of the race for that. So I think I think we're gonna have uh, a lot of those uh, in the in the coming weeks because riders are used to it and yeah I can't re- I can't understand really what what's wrong about that you know okay we have to take care of the environment that's for sure but you know you have to be able to interpret certain situations. Oh, but hang think- on, uh, you you also had a rider which you told us on the group chat you know, on uh, a rider kicked out of the race down in Spain yesterday GP Miguel Underine for throwing a, a gel wrapper. And again, this is instilled and it, it, it just, mm-hmm. the, 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 the ripple effects of this, just imagine. Okay. When we were chatting and I were watching the race and I was like, what happens if you, if you crash and the bottle comes out and you, you get up and you forgot to bit the bottle back on your bike and you take off and the bottle sitting, do they then kick you out of the race? Or what happens if you do your best to get that gel in your back pocket and Holy shit, the thing flies out. Like, and like everything with the UCI, my biggest, biggest fear is there going to be no consistency here. Watch you watch this. If they're kicking mm-hmm. guys out of the tour Flanders for throwing a bottle to a kid on the side of the road, by the way, that, that kid will never forget that the rest of his life. He thinks that's the coolest gift he's gotten up until this point. And, mm-hmm. and now you're kicking people out and something's going to happen. You watch some, one of the bigger races, somebody more high profile in the league, or, or maybe it, it, they're, they're never consistent. Right. And that's to me, that is the problem. I think this is a dumb rule. What's even dumber is inconsistency on how we apply the rules. Yeah. I don't think anybody would um, disagree with you there. Lance, it's crazy to see these guys getting thrown out of one of the biggest races of the years for a thing that we've all been doing our whole careers. And it's just like Johan said, it's really hard to turn the switch off. I do think we need to go back to the fight in the beginning, but we need to point out that I would say, and Johan, Back me up on this. 50% of this field, these are the best riders in the world, almost have no chance of finishing in the embrace. 
They have no chance. They know they're not going to finish the race. So their one goal is to make the breakaway, whether it's for mm-hmm. 100 kilometers or 150 kilometers, just to get this far along, close to the finish, so they can help their team leaders out. So it, there's a lot of tension at the start. That it's one of the most tense neutral zones in the entire uh, calendar as well, because 50% of the guys, their only goal is to make that first breakaway. And they're going to treat that like that's their finish line is to make the breakaway. So that's where all these tensions come from. Guys get into it cut each other off, get into fights. Um, it's a sad thing to see, but there is a lot of tension at the start of Tour of Flanders. I'm, su- I'm surprised that fights don't happen more often. Compare If you compare it to a lot of other sports, you know, there's elbow nudging and this, and, you know, you're hardly going to hurt someone in American football, right? And, you know, soccer players get kicked in the shins. You're, you're not likely to die. With cycling, it's it's incredibly dangerous. The speed's and, 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 you know, the, the, the high risk that you can have. And if, if you're having issues with people, I quite, I really am surprised it, it doesn't happen more. So my question to so you, it happens, it happens all the time, JB, it's called quack and people <laughs> quack each other all day long in the Peloton. You just don't catch it on TV, but it happens all day long, every day, every race that we all did that they're doing now, they're quacking each other, whether it becomes fists, hands off the bars, not that doesn't happen that often, but bars against bars and shoulders against shoulders happens constantly throughout the day. Did you guys ever have a big fight to where it went off the bike physically? No. George, no. George, for sure not. No, George. <laughs> no. George is too nice. But it's funny you talk about George, you bring up Quacken because before he retired in what, 97 or 98, the, literally the biggest quacker of all time. Is that guy sitting in Madrid right now? Is Johan Bernil? It was such a fucker. <laughs> he was. Listen, oh, I mean, oh. I had to. I had to. That was my. That was my. That was my tactics to remain in the front. I wasn't strong enough, so you know, I had to put my handlebars where you know, just where it went through. So you know. And- and that, you know what, that's a, a very important skill in cycling. You got, you got to be a quacker <laughs> to stay in the front. Yeah. Do, uh, do yeah. teams ever have an enforcer like they do in hockey? Somebody who, who just sets the record straight. If any team could hurt. We all aren't Lance Armstrong. We can just sit in the front and people go, Oh, it's Lance. So he can, he can go where he wants. Like some of us, like Johan and I, we had to quack our way to the front and establish yes, that. Yes, position. This is, it, it, it was a great question. And George, you're just, just a cheap shot. Okay. But well, I think reality we, need is, to go, we're, we're we, we have, stories. I had guys like George and, and Pablo and Eki. I mean, that, that, those guys, they're not enforcers like hockey, but, but when they, when, when others see them around and, 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 you know, favorite with somebody like those guys, yeah, they, they realize, okay, that's, you know, that's their real estate. Yeah. I know, but you know, there's a huge difference between the races you were focusing on Lance and, you know, the race like today today is exactly it's just yeah. a war zone and you know it's true what, what george says whatever these guys did and they were kicked out of the race at the beginning things that were 10 times worse have happened over and over and over again in this race nobody sees it because it's in the middle of the peloton uh some have caused crashes uh there's been there's been quite a lot of crashes but i think you know what's most important is to see that you know let's not forget to go back to the rules the, the new safety rules let's say and you know let's not forget that this this new legislation, let's say, in, in, in cycling, it all came after the crash of Fabio Jakobsen last year in Poland. Mm. And so I heard from a commentator on TV, you know, there's there's apparently there's there's 50 something, 50 plus situations, new situations in which you can get fined or kicked out of the race. Whether it's throwing away a bottle or drop uh, or you know go on the sidewalk or this or that, and there's I think two or three which is for followers like motorbikes in the race. There's not a single one for organizers. Everything is on the riders, which is which is completely madness. Because if you think you know I mean what we saw last year was these crashes were because of you know, poor fencing and uh, poor barriers in, in, in Tour of Poland, for example, and other races. Now, luckily, they, they get to a better system, but still, um, I, I really can't see what throwing a bottle away, or in the, the case of the guy yesterday, for example, he didn't throw it away. He lost a gel. He lost a gel. <laughs> and he was kicked out of the race. I, you know, I, I don't know of any sport where the International Federation is more alienated from, you know, from more distance from the sport than than cycling they, and they really have no clue and you yeah. know to know 
that there's ex cyclists involved in there. I, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what yeah. they're doing. Well, my favorite, if we're, let's move on. Cause we could talk yeah. about this all day, but my favorite is always when the, like, like the three K banner, like some, some kid walks by and unplugs it and it falls over the road. <laughs> like what kind of shit is this man? Bush what? league. But, uh, anyways, because we were talking about the water bottles and some friends of mine were messaging me because they, they did see that the guy was DQ'd from the race. And then they see uh, Vanderpool and Asgreen tossing their yeah. bottles a couple right. K out. So, uh, Johan, they, they, they have designated areas. I mean, is that something yeah, that-, that was, that was legal because they um, apparently yesterday in the meeting before the race, they said, okay, you know, just, they know that if it comes to a sprint, they, they want to get rid of the extra weight or you know an extra bottle for the last two kilometers so i think between between three and two there was there was a designated zone where they could throw away obviously they both did that uh, so that was that was fine uh but you know anyway so. but it was interesting because we i didn't know that so i'm watching the race and they both mm-hmm. threw their bottles and i'm like okay now here we go what what, what are they going to do <laughs> are they i didn't know there was a de- designated zone but like are, are they then, these guys are obviously going to get first and second. Are we going to just disqualify or uh, kick them out too? No, but uh, yeah, uh, it, well, was, it, it's, it was, it was, it's complicated it was complicated and it's, it's, the rules are complicated. And I think, you know, it's like you say, Lance, you know, they need, there needs to be a consistency, which is not going to happen. And it just, you know, adds to the confusion of, of, of the sport already. It's already enough complicated uh, to understand it the way it is. Right. I mean, I'm doing everything I can to buy the sport back. I, it's just not, it's not that easy. You guys got to mm-hmm. give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, before we do talk about what I think was just an excellent, excellent race and a surprise ending. And although Johan, mm-hmm. you were sort of teasing us on our chat there that eh, you never know, but we'll get into the details in a sec. Today's show also brought to you by Ventum. Uh, this is my go-to whip, uh, certainly on the road and on the gravel. Premium bike brand launched in 2014, direct to consumer. Uh, like a few others out there, they often offer custom fits, off, uh, custom colors, custom specs, uh, and a 30 day money back guarantee. No questions asked. You don't like it? Send it back. Uh, they're designed from the ground up, hand assembled in the US, and shipped from their Utah headquarters. Head on over to ventumracing.com and use the promo code THE MOVE. Get you a new Ventum 10% off. Uh, until the end of April, until the end of the classics. Uh, last one here, LMNT again. Uh, I've been having to hammer the LMNT down here because it's uh, I'm down in the islands, man, uh, and and I'm 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 working out. I'm swimming, although I don't know that I sweat that much when I swim. But I think you I think you technically do sweat when you swim. Um, uh, I, I love this one, and and so much feedback we get uh, are getting from the listeners or the viewers that, uh, it's working for them too. So thousand milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, no sugar, no gluten, no crap in it. It is the real deal. Uh, get your eight pack sample for the cost of shipping, head on over to drink slash the move and get your recharge sample pack for just the cost and- of shipping. And they just came out with a new flavor, watermelon, which is amazing. Oh, really good. I just got some of it. I've been on the road uh, for a couple of weeks, so I hope, I hope I hope to get home and have a package of that. Yeah, you know? I just got it last week. Yeah. Well, uh, who knew? You know, I guess. But, but you know, here's the thing: you think about a six-hour bike race that's two hundred what sixty kilometers over uh, nineteen uh, cobbled climbs. You just never know. I mean, uh, Osgreen is, is a strong guy as a power sprint um, boy. And my pick, and by the way, Vanderpool was my pick. I never went, I never picked the right guy. Um, so I didn't yet again, didn't, didn't uh, have it, but I loved the race. I thought, I just thought it was a total heavyweight fight. These guys duking it out. Uh, even Ala Philippe was there for a minute. It looked like he had a, a bit of a hung, hunger strike and disappeared, but these three guys, it was, uh, uh, it was exciting. Yeah, it was, it was kind of, it was definitely a, you know, a typical sort of Flanders with the, with the, the approach the second time up to the Queer Mount down the new Queer Mount, which in my opinion, yo, and I think you would agree is the most Terrible. stressful approach Terrible. to any climb mm-hmm. in, in any, any race that we do. It's 60 Terrible. to 70 kilometers an hour. The, the Peloton is all spread out. There's curbs popping up in the middle of nowhere. And it's just a real sort of, 
you, it's not like you can just sit in the front and just stay in the front on your own because you're going to burn up all your matches for the climb. So it's a real sort of artwork, I like to call it, where you have to float the first 30 guys, wait till the last minute. The top guys, they know when to go, but there's just so many variables that can happen before that right turn that takes you to the small road to get you up to the Quermont. It's just that is the most stressful uh, approach to any climb in all of cycling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, today, this, today we didn't see any, any, any crashes because I think, you know, the, the, the second time they went there, the peloton was already, uh, you know, there was already a little, little selection. But, um, I mean, from there on, you know, I, I, initially I thought, you know, Van der Poel really, you know, he, he, uh, he did a, a big attack there. And I thought, okay, you know, he's, he's super, super strong. But then we had, the, you know, Van Aert and, and uh, and uh, Vanderpool and and um, who was the, uh, Asgreen and and you know the three of them were separated and there already you could start to see Asgreen you know could come back on the on the Paterberg they were equal I would say maybe maybe Asgreen a little bit stronger uh, yeah. you, I, initially I was thinking you know maybe you know Vanderpool has played it smart he's not going to make sure that stays with Asgreen and make it together but the fact that Asgreen collaborated from the beginning as soon as they were with three guys was a sign that he was feeling really strong. Well, he sat, on, he, he, sat on, he sat on for a little bit. He sat on because he had his team leader that, and that's what yeah. we were, the conversation we were having as we watched, it's like, all right, hang on. You're you know, the world champion. Your team leader is in the second group and you're taking a few pulls. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I mean, maybe well, look, we don't know what conversations these guys have in the radio. Alaphilippe could have just said, you know, it's not my day. Uh, give it well, your that, best, go for it. That, he was my pick and uh, you saw how, how fast he went up to Koppenberg, which that is usually a real indication of, you know, what their legs are looking to be like at the finish. It's, it's close to the finish already but within 50 kilometers. He was by far the strongest up to Koppenberg, uh, just rode away from everybody. But at the same time, he might've burned a bit too many matches because after that he was sort of on the back foot. And when those guys um, attacked away on what's that, the climb was a, it's a, it's not a cobble climb, but it's right before the, the Quermont. That's where they rode away from Alaphilippe. You can tell that he mm. a good a good Alaphilippe would have never hesitated. He would have yeah. gone right on that move, but he just but hang on. he was but empty hang on at that point. He doesn't have the HP that those two guys have. He just doesn't. I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to be uh, negative, but he the, those got what today today he didn't. But he's got, I don't he's think got these, these uh, no for this are, race, George. For yeah, this George, I agree with no that. For this kind yeah. of race. Van, no. uh, you know, Alaphilippe is not the same. I mean, he's he's more a hilly rider. Um, but for the, for this race, I think Van der Poel and Van Aert are, are a level, a level up to, uh, yeah. did you, did you guys not watch Thor Flanders? Like what, four months ago? When was that? <laughs> he was right there with them. I think he, 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 he perhaps showed a bit mm. too many cards early on too early. I think today, has, George, yeah. I disagree. I disagree with you that Alaphilippe <laughs> was the strongest on the Koppenberg though, because you know, if you've, if you've watched closely, Alaphilippe was already ahead. He was in mm -hmm. a breakaway. The strongest guy on the Koppenberg was by far Van der Poel, by far. You know, he he, he dropped Van Aert and he bridged up to Alaphilippe. And then Van der Poel went, every climb he went a little bit less. You know, I think I think he was, obviously he was also, he was alone. Uh, but they were all alone. And um, I think that was, you know, today, uh, today I think Van der Poel was, he paid the price of being the huge favorite and, Came across an Ask Green who was, you know, was incredibly strong, crazy. You know, strong, I, and Johan, tell me this: I, I saw a story that that uh, um, that Quick Step was going to race with with clinchers as opposed to yeah. sort of the traditional uh, sew ups. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is this got to be the first time, or maybe not. You would know better, but did the first time that somebody's think about a race like Tour of Flanders to win it on clinchers. If you, if you would have said that 10, 20, 50 years, people would have thought mm -hmm. you were out of your mind and said that will never happen so it's, it's well, a cool, it's, tech, cool technical it's story. happening it's happening it's happening and apparently um i mean i think the technology has evolved so much that you know they have the width they have the softness yeah and can, uh there's 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 this this foam inside that basically when they when they when they puncture they can keep going they can keep going a little bit it's not it's I, not completely flat they, I don't know if they use the did they use the foam today because it, it weighs a lot more there's a i don't i know a weight. I know issue there, but there, the tire pressure is definitely something that's very important for these races. And with clinchers, mm -hmm. you can play with that a lot more. And are, are mm -hmm. these tubeless tires? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure everybody's oh, in tubeless. 
they were uh, uh, elegant, elegant uh, quick step. They changed their name today. They had a different, different uh, sponsor name. Elegant is one of the models of the Koenig of the of the windows. Uh, they were uh, they were racing tubeless today. And as I'm glad you said, I was watching the race and the guy kept saying elegant quick step. And, you know, after a while, I was like, man, he really <laughs> likes these guys. I mean, shit, nobody in cycling's ever been called elegant, but he keeps calling these guys elegant. I'm like, all right, dude, the man crush has to stop. All right. And then it, and then, it, <laughs> then they clarified that it was a, another name of another window they make. And, uh, but I was like, it just had me thrown for a second. Mm-hmm. Elegant. So yeah, it was really interesting how uh, Vanderpool rode away from Van Aert, Van Aert and um, Askreen on the Quare Mountain. The last time of the Quare Mountain, just just rode away from them when the when the climb gets steep. Um, but I found it super interesting that Casper just didn't panic, kept his pace, brought him back on that slight uphill road leading up to the Pottersburg, which we all know is a very very difficult road. But he you know he kept his cool, brought it back, and like you said, Johan, he was equally if not as strong as Vanderpool on the Pottersburg. Um, he which, looks better. I thought, yeah, he looked, he looked better. They put yeah. another five or six seconds on Ben Art, who, who some of us thought he might, may or may not be coming back. Um, but then at the end, I mean, I know from there after the Pottersburg is a nice steep technical downhill for two K then it's flat K 10 or flat 10 kilometers to the finish. Ashgreen was working with him toe to toe and uh, was super strong. Got the, the go time. ahead from the team. Obviously, um, Alain Philippe at that point was ready in the second or third group, so he w- he had no chance of coming back. Uh, so they were thinking, you know, all or nothing. I don't know. I I know we we knew that Askreen has a good sprint. He sprinted really good in the past, but Vanderpool was super confident. I mean, he basically uh, there was for one kilometer. Um, yeah, and I'm glad you said. I mean, there was no question who was going to lead out the sprint. Like so normally, they play a little games. I mean, it was like they just defaulted to that. I mean, he yep. Askren got that second wheel. And uh, yeah, the, that, that came both from uh, obviously Vanderpool's confidence, but also the fact that, you know, on paper, he should be faster. He's going to look back and say, I probably didn't need to pull that hard. We had 25 seconds on the, the yeah. second group and he was, he wasn't going easy that last 700 meters and that's energy being taken away from his sprint. So he just had this, you know, ultra confidence for that sprint, but paid for it dearly at the end. Oh, he just ran out of legs. You know, I mean, yep. if, you, if you compare, it was exactly until until 100 meters before the finish, it was exactly the same situation as last year on the same side of the road, looking back on the same side. And but the difference was that as soon as Asgreen made intention to go, Van der Poel went and he didn't get a full bike length compared so to question. last year. He had that on Van Aert. Question for you. If he did not lead it out so aggressively for the last 700 meters. Do you think he could have won? I mean, obviously. Mm. I think the strongest guy won. There's no question yeah. about that. Uh, you know, he, you, you don't, you don't really know. I mean, after you can feel great, but you know, after 260 kilometers, you know, you, you, you get out of the saddle and all of a sudden it's, it's not there anymore. You know, yeah. personally, I think he, he must have felt already something on the positive perk. You know, because they were equal there, and you know, you could see that Van der Poel had to go in the. In, he was looking for the the soft spot on the right. Oh, I, th- I found that interesting too, because that is slightly easier, but also much more risky. You mm-hmm, get you get mm-hmm. that your front wheel caught in that lip, seeing the douches, you're going down. So for him to ride that, <laughs> I agree. It was a, it was a little questionable about how good he was feeling there. Yeah, yeah, but still, and, I mean, and, you know, listen. I mean, you're, you, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just. Uh, you go ahead, Johan. I was. I was. Kind yeah. Of throwing no. You I mean, I, th- I think it's you know so so difficult for. I mean, let's not forget. You know, both Van der Poel and Van Aert, they are always the favorite. I mean, how difficult must it be, you know, to always be there and then finish it, you know, and 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 of course, you know, it's. I, I think a part of, a part of, all the energy he spent physically, but the stress that comes in the final with it, of being the favorite and having to win. Mm. And this, that's obviously the advantage of a guy like Oscar. And he was there. Okay. Everybody just assumed he was going to get second. So that was going to be great. And, you know, he, he could, he could, he could take advantage of that. Right. For, and for, and think about for us as, as viewers, as fans, everybody watching it, how exciting does it make these, these races? I mean, look what happened in Milan San Remo. Nobody was counting on Stoyman or counting on Stoyman. So the, the big three, so to speak, you know, are mm-hmm. beatable. They aren't unbeatable. And uh, these guys are showing it right now. So it's making yeah. the racing a lot more exciting. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I don't think we should have, we shouldn't have been so surprised by Asgreen because he, he just won like 10 days ago as well, right? And yes, in a very yeah. impressive fashion. Away, he was away solo for a while, and then re attacked the group once they caught them. That you don't, you rarely see that in cycling. You know, who also good was your, your, your man, uh, Tom Pitcock, Johan. This kid's, I mean, right for a young yeah, guy. you know, he's, he's, he's young. I mean, in theory, he, you know, if there would be an under 23 tour of Flanders, he would race, he, he would still race it. <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, it's amazing to see, you know, we always come back on, on cyclocross, but you know, there's Van Aert, there's Van Der Poel, there's Ala Philippe, who's an ex French champion cyclocross. There's Pitcock. Uh, this guy, the French guy from uh, total direct, what's his name? Uh, Turgi, also a cyclocross guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, that guy was really and, impressive, by the way. Really impressive. Well, I'm, I'm getting impressed with uh, Warren Bagheel as well. I mean, for being a, a climber, mm -hmm. you know, wearing the mountain jersey in the Tour de France, he's he's racing quite well in these classic races. I didn't even know that why he was going to race them, and uh, but I'm very impressed with how well he's doing. Yeah. How is it we've gone this far and uh, George has not brought up Greg Van Avermaet? Yes, I was waiting. Oh, I was waiting podium, for that. Podium. Oh, God. My I'm boy got podium. Not, not only did he get podium. His, you you, you hey. took down his poster and put up another poster. <laughs> oh. My boy got podium and a very solid move. And you know what? I was a little bit concerned with how hard he's been racing leading up to this. Johan, I mean, he's been going full, full gas in every classic race since at San Remo. I mean, I, I would have probably taken it easy on one of those races or not done it at all, but he's still there, you know, fighting mm -hmm. for the podium, gets the podium. I was, I was very happy to see him get third. No, he's a solid rider, you know, and no at the end you could see the two guys in the front were tired, but behind it was all dead bodies also. Yeah. Um, you know, you could see, for example, a guy like the guy, the guy who wins the sprint is a guy we never saw the whole day, except for Mark, you know, comes, he was, he was a bit sick. He didn't race all week. So, I mean, they were all super, super tired. And, uh, and that's obviously when a guy like Van Avermaet with the experience and the endurance, um, gets to the front. So, I mean, great, great, great ride from your boy. Congrats, George. And he, and he <laughs> hung you. in there. I mean, he just, cause he was never, you know, he was at one point back in that third group and he mm -hmm. just kept, I mean, this race, you you can, if you, if you hang around the hoop long enough, you might get a shot. So Johan, what, what happens now? I mean, the, the postponement in Roubaix, this is, you know, a, a big deal. I mean, th this, these guys plan their whole year around these two weeks. So yeah. right now all these guys are in obviously tip top shape. What do they do? Do they take the break early now, or is there another race that they're going to focus on? Well, I mean, I've seen that uh, Van Aert has uh, changed his program and uh, does now Amstel Gold race, uh, which was not on his, on his schedule normally. Uh, and on, on the contrary, Van der Poel has announced that he's not doing Amstel Gold Race, which is a weird, I mean, that I was a bit of a shocker. You know, he, he won that race already. It's his home race. But, you know, I think Van Aert and, and Van der Poel, it's, it's a special case because they have been racing all winter. They have to get a break at some point, you know, because obviously there's, they, they have other goals uh, in, during the season. So, um, yeah, man, but... I mean, too bad that, uh, you know, I, I can't really understand. I, I think it's a political thing. You know, Paris-Roubaix, you know, it's in France, but it's basically, I mean, it's it's close to the same area, George. You yeah, know, I mean, yeah. it's the same part of the world. And as, as far as I know, the virus doesn't know any borders. Um, there's, there's, other, there's another race which goes close to, I mean, like goes five kilometers from, from Roubaix. Yeah, uh, which is in Belgium now that, that race. So that's too bad. I think I think it's possible to organize races when you know. I think Flanders Classics is proving it. There's races in Spain. There's races everywhere. Unfortunately, I think the the, the politics uh, in, in in France have prevented even that ASO could not use their power to organize Paris to Bay. So that's that's a real bummer. Mm. <clears throat> Agreed. So yeah, I mean, uh, Lance, I got a really kind of. Little, little strange picture last night of this new uh, this new haircut you got going. I think the, the viewers need to see what's what's happening here in live. You want to want to show us what exactly so, is going on I, here? I, I'm not quite sure where you got that photo, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was you know um, I, it was just getting shaggy. And I was down here in the islands, man, and it was it just I don't know, and I, uh, I I was just not happy with with the shag. Um, and I wanted to clean it up. So I of course down here with all the kids and, uh, and, and my sixth child, it seems like, uh, shadow mountain. And I was like, Hey, do you think you could cut my hair? 
He's like, of, of course. And then, then of course, all the kids think that it's a good idea that they contribute to the haircut. So with like some <laughs> janky, shitty scissors and, and a, a, like a, a buzzer that's more for like beards. Um, <clears throat> it, it did. That's what it ended up like. So, you know, it, it <clears throat> I can do the reveal for those watching. Um, or, or you could just use that picture that George threw. Well, up, I, have, but... I have another one as well, cause I'm getting all kinds of pictures from LA. On <laughs> I like the little part to the side there. I mean, that's, that's you know, I gotta say, you know, uh, that actually, I think I actually look pretty dope right there, but, uh, yeah, it's in, uh, you know, that was the picture you just showed was, was, uh, you know, I had was quaffed a little bit. This not right now, this is straight out of bed and after watching the race, but, um, you know, it's just, yeah, it's kind of buzzed on the side. Can you see that? And then the back, that's the one thing I tell Chad. I was like, I think you, I think you fucked up the back. Like you, you, it needed to be a little more blended. If that's blended and faded a little bit, I think it's crazy. It's like amazing, but I will give him credit for, for the tools that he had. It, it came out. And, and as I was sitting there and it took forever, I was, I was like, Oh my God, my hair, uh, I know it. everything grows out, but I, I don't know that it'll ever be the same, but it looks all right. Did Chad manscape you too while he was at it? <laughs> uh, he's sitting over here in the chat. They, they're asking if there's any manscaping has gone on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is not a family show. This is the move. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no manscaping. Uh, Anna, we may, we, we get, never mind. Um, the haircut looks absolutely dope. It, if you want to get this in a barber shop, it would cost at least a grand. So <laughs> that's how I pay him back. Oh, God. All right. Well, so what, what, are we not doing a show for Rubé? I guess not. We got a, we got a week off. There is no party, Rubé. Right. So we're, that's all right. Well, when, I'm trying to lead into when we, We'll be back for Liège. We'll be back for Liège. Where Johan, one time they had a stage finish in the Tour de France and he stole it from the great Miguel Anderay and sat on him the whole time and beat him in the sprint. Not, not, not too different than what we saw. You're forgetting the guy that was dropped. I, I, I know if, what you're saying. You're forgetting I how I got away. Yeah, I know. I, I was the, the, I, the last guy who got dropped from my wheel. From my wheel. Like from my wheel. I needed this haircut at Relax. the time. I would have made Relax. it if I had this haircut at that time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Liege right. Liege. We'll be back there. Yeah. yeah, that'll be. And then, and uh, I don't know if we want to, you know, two weeks, anything can happen. But if we want to try to, I, uh, if we want to talk about some predictions, I, I, I um, what do you guys think? No, I think we should wait. Uh, yeah, I'm not ready know, for it. Tour of the Basque okay. Country now, which is yep. you know typical. I mean, different different riders. Um, yep. So, yep. I, okay. Yeah. Well, Ala Philippe is Ala Philippe will be there, but you know there will be Roglic and Pogacar yeah. and, and yeah. those guys. So, okay. Well, and we forgot to mention to everybody, Happy Easter! Holy cow! Yeah. yeah. Happy Easter, all you children Happy out Easter. there listening to the move. All these bad things that are said on here. You know, hope I hope that Easter egg hunt you're about to go on will erase it from your memory. But uh, seriously, happy Easter. We we're going to do an Easter egg hunt later today. Uh, George, I know you uh, have an Easter egg hunt as well. Ten minutes. Yep. Yep. And uh, Mark and I are going to go for an open water swim. These guys drove us out yesterday. The wind was howling, and these dudes drove us out on this boat. And I was like, yeah. He's like, take us over here. We're going to go for a swim. You should have seen these guys. They were like, no, no, no. You can't. You can't get out of the boat. You can't swim. You you're going to die. Yeah, it's like crazy no, currents. These currents were ripping. And then we got right on the other side of the sandbar and it would just lay down. It was amazing. So I'm going to go get another it beats flip turns. It beats chlorine. It beats all the other BS that comes with, you know, master swimming like I'm used to. So I'm going to go hit one, that. One more final note about your buddy Chato. You know, I gave him, I gave him a little shit for not getting an invite to Bahamas. He gets the family invite. You know, right. I want to quote, I want to quote what El Chato said. Okay. When you get to Chato status, the shirt stays off and the invites get bigger and bigger. <laughs> that sounds exactly like something he would say. I will relay that. I will let him know that that was uh, um, passed on on the show today. So, hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in to the move. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks.